Welcome to worship on this Ash Wednesday, this beginning of our annual Lenten journey. Uh, the theme of our services this year are his final steps. Uh, each night we will be looking at uh, one of the steps along the way that Jesus takes uh, as he makes his final journey through his ministry to the cross. Tonight we see that uh, his uh, final steps took him uh, to the temple, his father's house, which was in need of cleansing and was meant to be a house of prayer. Our, our word of God tonight on which the sermon is based is from the book of Matthew chapter 21. We read verses 12 and 13. Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. This is God's word. Brothers and sisters in Christ, do you have a place that you go sometimes when you are facing a crisis Maybe there is some location where you can land, uh, help you get your head together before the next big challenge in life. In the early years of my ministry, and even right up till today, my parents' house was off an oasis for me and my family, uh, an opportunity to get away from the pressures of ministry or of life in general. Maybe uh, you know others, as I do, who have a, a park or a secluded spot, a cabin perhaps, that they use as a refuge so that they are able to collect their wits, uh, that they are able to be ready for the next big thing. Churches have often served as this kind of a refuge from the world, sitting alone in a big sanctuary, a big empty sanctuary, it serves as a good place a good way to pray, to reflect, to recover your sanity and perspective. In Galilee, we hear that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places to pray, and sometimes he would take the disciples with him to get away from the crowds for a little while so they could get some rest. As he entered Jerusalem at the beginning of Holy Week on Palm Sunday, then it should not surprise us that one of the first places where he's going to find himself in this biggest week of his life, in this hardest week of his life, is at the temple, his father's house, where early in life at the age of 12, he had spent three days living when his parents left him behind after they were done with this same Passover celebration. Along the way to the cross, Jesus' final steps led him to his father's house. But he wasn't going to find uh, much peace or opportunity for prayer when he came to the temple on that day, as he found on an earlier trip to the temple three years ago in his ministry. These outer courts, which should have been a place of preaching and prayer and praise, had been so filled with business, money changers and livestock salesmen, ba banking and bartering, that it was impossible to do anything else. This angered him. And so tonight, as his steps lead him to his father's house, we find with him a house that needed cleansing and a house meant for prayer. It was late in the day on Palm Sunday when Matthew tells us Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the many changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you're making it a den of robbers. Some of this business going on in the court of the Gentiles, the uh, outer court of the temple, was business that had to take place someplace. Temple worship, you may remember, had one feature of worship which was not common to the way we worship today. There was animal sacrifice. This was the Passover. And Practically every family in the nation would be sacrificing a sheep. In, in addition to the regular population of Jerusalem, the city had swollen by hundreds of thousands as people came from all over Israel to worship. In fact, as they came from nations all across the Mediterranean world, they had come for the Passover feast. Once this had been a nation 
that was primarily sheep farmers, sheep herders. But at this point in time, farming was much more diverse, and the citizens of the country had become much more urbanized and f been attracted to other ways of life. Many people worked as merchants or tradesmen. You, you remember how Jesus himself was trained as a carpenter because that is what his father Joseph had been. Not everyone was going to be a person who raised his own sheep. People had to get their sacrificial animals somewhere, and it wasn't practical to bring a live sheep all the way from a surrounding country like Egypt, Arabia, or Greece. Those coming to the festival, to the feast, also faced another challenge. The Greek drachma, or Roman denarius, was not accepted as legal tender in the temple courts. If you were paying a tithe or making a purchase, you were required to use the Tyrian shekel. It was no more a Jewish currency than the drachma or the denarius were, but these shekels had a better reputation for being pressed from pure silver and of matching in weight that which was advertised. And never mind that the shekel also had on the head's face of it an image of the false god Baal. The requirement for this form of payment was uh, one way that the administrators of the temple tried to guarantee the value of their income. Now, it was convenient for the worshipers to do their banking and shopping in the temple. There were just two problems. The noise and the distraction made it impossible to worship in this space anymore. And it seems clear from Jesus' quotes of Isaiah and Jeremiah that the, that the business practices of those involved had become corrupt. They had turned God's house into a den of robbers. The rate of exchange, the, the price for the animals was not fair. They took advantage of these pious pilgrims. Well, what could the worshipers do? They were trapped. You know how when you go to an arena or an airport or an amusement park, the cost of food or other products can often be two or three times what you would find in a local grocery store or restaurant. There's so little competition. The vendors have a captive audience. So the merchants and the money changers in Jesus' day took advantage of the visitors who suffered from limited options. Jesus found his father's house then in need of cleansing. So that is what he did. He drove out all those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. He was not willing to see this place of worship desecrated by those who were using it. He was not willing to tolerate the corruption and the greed. Now, I have never seen a sanctuary of a Christian church abused in quite the same way. What Jesus encountered is not the same thing as a bake sale in the fellowship hall of a church congregation or Christian books which are being sold from the church office. These things don't generally involve deception, coercion, interruption of worship, or personal profit. But then, our churches aren't really the equivalent of uh, God's temple today, are they? That would be our own bodies, our own hearts. You remember what Paul once asked uh, Christians in Corinth in his first letter to them, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? And the filth of the business going on there, here, actually makes the merchants and money changers in the temple of Jesus' day look relatively innocent. Is there a sin that doesn't pollute the Father's house in this Christian heart? The statistics for Christian men who use pornography are disconcerting, as well as those for Christian couples who are sharing a bed before they get married. Our God clearly condemns cursing, swearing, obscenity, and vulgarity in his word, but people claiming to belong to Christ often get down in the gutter with their less spiritual neighbors, peppering their speech with the same kind of trashy talk that desecrates the mouths of the people around them. 
in our land of plenty, our greed may not always show itself so much in dishonest business practices, although the scandals of clergymen enriching themselves at the uh, disadvantage of the church are common enough. But once God has uh, graciously placed the riches in our hands, how do we use them then? How big a house does a, a man and a woman and their 1.5 kids really need? How many TVs can you watch? How many, what features make it uh, necessary to drop $1,000 on a, another phone every time a new model comes along? And what does all of this say about who really reigns as God in the temples of our own hearts? Thank God Jesus came to cleanse his father's houses on this week. Pushing the peddlers out of the temple was only a, a preview of the real house cleaning that Jesus had planned. Five days later, blood ran from his back, torn open by the lashes of the whips, the stripes he received in Pilate's court. His face was streaked with blood dripping from the wounds of his forehead, where the Roman soldiers were pounding a crown of thorns into his skull. Jesus' lifeblood has the real cleansing power, especially that blood which flowed from his hands and feet pierced by iron spikes which were holding him to the cross. The letter to the Hebrews warns us the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. and Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. But John's first letter promises that this is exactly what Jesus does. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, purifies us from all sin. He doesn't drive it away by force. He removes it from view by his grace. He applies this cleansing blood to the sin that occupies our hearts by faith. And once applied... It keep, keeps cleansing those hearts all through life. You can be sure that that animal trade and that money changing in the temple returned the next day, maybe that very same evening. But Jesus' single sacrifice has made us perfect forever. And each time we hear the gospel preached, each time it is spoken to us, it assures us again and again that our hearts are pure and clean. This house needed cleaning. It needs cleaning as much as that temple in Jerusalem ever did because this too is God's house, the place that he has chosen to live today. For when Jesus cleanses his father's house, it can again become a house of prayer. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. We have different words for prayer. The various requests in the Lord's Prayer we refer to as petitions. We are seeking something from God when we petition him. Supplication is a kind of fancy word for prayer. It suggests a sense of urgency when we beg God for his help. Uh, confession or thanksgiving or praise. These are other kinds of prayers that describe a part of a believer's conversation with God. The word that Jesus uses to describe his Father's house here understands prayer this way. This is our opportunity to come to him. God has made a way for us. It is possible for us to approach him and to talk to him about whatever we need. Sometimes, maybe, we just need someone to listen, someone who is uh, willing to uh, let us get something off of our chest. Sometimes we come because we need relief, we need mercy, even salvation. Whatever it is, God has always intended his house to be, a, to be a place where we can come and to find him when we arrive. This is where Jesus, cleansing, steps in and accomplishes our access. We have already pointed out how the money business in the temple prevented the prayers of the people. Cleansing that facility perhaps opened it back up to prayers for a few hours or a day. 
We know all too well, however, how sin interferes with prayer in our hearts. We could add more to those that we have already listed. Feelings like worry, doubt, pride, resentment, and discontent all go along with the activities we mentioned before. By forgiving these, Jesus has opened a way. He has given us courage and trust to come to God. He has made us acceptable to him. Forgiveness makes our own hearts a house of prayer where God lives something he always meant to be, it to be. We still end our worship today in the same way that they ended their worship at the temple so many years ago with a benediction, a promise of God's grace, love, and blessing. Go tonight, certain that these blessings are yours. For Jesus has visited his Father's house again and cleansed it from its sins. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.